while mitochondria are surely known to many, if not most of you, I, I do want to highlight what pivotal role they had to play in our evolution and still have to play in our everyday life. Because it was billions of years ago that a bacteria would merge with a very simple cell organism. And in that symbiosis lies the, actually the origin of complex life. It's nothing short of the Big Bang of us. Now, these bacteria at the time, they would produce energy to the cell, while the cell would offer an environment for these bacteria to thrive. And that ultimately gave rise to many of the complex cell functions that we enjoy today. And so mitochondria, unsurprisingly, have a very important role to play in our cells. In fact, they're present in almost all cells of the body, taking on the role of energy production, but also are involved in cell differentiation pathways, different signaling um, pathways, as well as cell apoptosis. And so it shouldn't come as a surprise that if you have damage to the mitochondria, you will have limited cell function, potentially ultimately leading to cell death. Now, we have found a way to use these little organelles therapeutically. But before I elaborate, I'd like to share the story of Avery. Avery was born with a complex heart defect. In the procedure to save her life, she sustained a prolonged lack of blood flow to the heart, a bit like a heart attack. She wouldn't recover. Her heart, after the procedure, would not pick up its beat, if you will. She had sustained a cardiogenic shock. These children have to be transferred on ECMO, a hard lung machine, to keep them alive. Once they're on that machine, there's no real treatment options. There's nothing to do but to wait. And after days on ECMO, Avery wouldn't recover. But fortunately, she was enrolled in a clinical trial ongoing at Boston Children's Hospital, receiving mitochondria transplantation as a direct injection into her heart to reinvigorate her myocardium and see the heart reinvigorated, reactivated. She was able to separate from this ECMO machine. And today, she's a happy and healthy young girl. Or to quote her mother, she's a rock star. Now, that was certainly a pivotal moment for uh, mitochondrial transplantation as a whole, as it was the, basically the ignition factor that brought about Selvi as a commercial pursuit. My co-founders wanted to make sure that this therapy would reach as many patients as possible. Now, the first application of this technology that we see is in cases such as Avery's in ischemia reperfusion injury. It sounds more complex than it is. It is simply the condition or the damage that arises whenever the flow of blood is interrupted and subsequently reintroduced. So medical conditions include heart attacks, strokes, organ transplantation. It's the world's number one killer. Nothing has worked to date. To treat truly the origin of ischemia reperfusion injury to save the cells that would otherwise die. Now, whilst the medical conditions are well known, what is less well known is that a key component to the path from injury to cell death is dysfunctional mitochondria upon the ischemic event, when the blood flow stops flowing. Because the blood transports oxygen, the mitochondria turn oxygen into energy. And when that is interrupted, that flow of blood and that flow of oxygen, the mitochondria take damage. Now, we've found a way to reinvigorate those mitochondria damaged in conjunction with ischemic injury by mitochondria transplantation. In fact, it was out of frustration of my co-founder that he tried mitochondria transplantation in the first place, because none of the agents that he was using was actually saving the mitochondria upon ischemic injury. The technology was developed at Harvard Medical School by Dr. McCulley and brought to the first clinical trial um, that saved Avery's life by Pedro and Ram. I joined them as a repeat entrepreneur in the medical space, so I would say we represent a relatively well-balanced founding team. We're very fortunate. And as a company, of course, um, we had to find an application that's reasonably let's say, affordable from a time and cost perspective to get the technology to the first patients. And for this, we picked kidney transplantation. 
kidney transplantation has um, a lot of advantages from a development perspective because um, it, its success is intimately tied to the ischemic injury that the kidney sustains. And also, if you look at clinical trial sizes based on the incidence rates, you actually see that it's amongst the ischemia reperfusion injury indications, such as heart attacks or strokes, the one where you probably need the least amount of patients to show clinical efficacy. And in particular, when developing a new modality, people care most about the clinical effect thereof. That's the point in time where the field actually has a chance to take off. And so we're really focusing on the what we consider the quickest and cheapest path to a clinical POC. We see this, of course, as a stepping stone. We believe on the one hand, of course, the large ischemia reperfusion injury markers, such as heart attacks, are, let's say, a step away from kidney transplantation. Once people believe in mitochondria transplantation as a means to treat ischemia reperfusion injury, you will be able to get the funding that's needed for these really large clinical trials. But ultimately, it should be the starting point to treating also more chronic conditions or to be used within aging-related diseases. We showed the impact of mitochondrial transplantation. It's not a daydream. In fact, we didn't just show or confirm, so to speak, the work that my co-founder had been doing, which was with autologous, freshly isolated mitochondria. We actually showed the efficacy in a kidney ischemia model, a harsh model with off-the-shelf mitochondria, meaning mitochondria we isolated from cells, we froze down, thought and used in those models. So a scalable product, a product that's manufacturable centrally that you can control in terms of good manufacturing practices. So for the first time, we've shown not only is mitochondrial transplantation an effective means to ameliorate ischemia reperfusion injury, we have done so with a commercially viable product. Now, the model in brief, so you all understand what um, we have been doing, is a pig model, since it's obviously the closest to the human that we can get. We picked 90 minutes of ischemia to the kidney to basically mimic the extent of injury such an organ would sustain during organ transplantation. And then we followed out the animals for four days and collected various biomarkers and ultimately tissue at the end. The results are exceptional. The gray is the control group. The areas that you, sorry, the biomarkers we tracked here is creatinine and bun, which are basically damage markers. The higher they are, the worse the kidney is doing, because the kidney is supposed to filter out these biomarkers. And as you can see here, with the treatment of our allogeneic off-the-shelf mitochondria, we showed more than 50% reduction in creatinine, for example. This is impact that you would expect to translate really well into the clinic. In fact, the PI that we were working with was super impressed by how quickly the kidney would recover from that really harsh injury of 90 minutes warm ischemia. And I reiterate, it's for the first time with a product that's commercially viable in the eyes of a large pharma company. To make it a little bit more plastic, um, for those who don't like to read graphs that much, this is actually work that was done by my co-founder. It's a two-hour hind limb ischemia model, so they bound off the blood flow to the hind leg and then treat it with mitochondria or well, without mitochondria. And as you can see here, without the mitochondria, the leg is being pulled back, it has essentially lost its function. With mitochondria, this looks very different. So you see how um, the impact of the therapy in retaining the muscle function is clearly discernible. And so, um, in fact, this work, as well as other work that was done at the Boston Children's Hospital, gave rise to the confidence that my co-founders felt in bringing this to the patient, as not only had the therapy been shown to be very efficacious, but also very safe. Because ultimately, the worst that could happen is that they do worse on their patients. And with the confidence from the broad animal studies that they did, they started this clinical trial. And it was in all these patients that had been suffering cardiogenic shock and then ended up on ECMO. And they showed that within 80% of the first 10 patients treated, because that's the control group study that they conducted, they can 
reinvigorate the myocardium. They can see the patients recover and get, a, get away from that ECMO machine. So I would say um, mitochondrial transplantation may be the first ever potentially efficacious therapy in ischemia perfusion injury. So what's been holding us back? Now, I think a key element in success is always, and I think you would agree, is money. Right? And we're very fortunate that um, Michael cares most about impact, not about the risk-return matrix. Because the reality is that new modalities often do not get the funding that they need because they fall through the risk-return matrix of traditional venture capital funds. These funds don't have a problem with deal flow. They can select whatever they want to invest in, but they have an incentive to create a certain return with a certain degree of probability. And so a key element holding us back was actually that there was a limited understanding and hence also a limited degree of confidence of those institutional investors. How does mitochondrial transplantation actually work? We've seen and shown that it probably worked through mitochondria as such to reinvigorate the cell energy metabolism. But the field had been, let's say, not um, uh, unanimously buying into the underlying mechanisms how that reinvigoration would take place. And so we, as a company, of course, were very aware of the problems that we would face especially when going out to raise 30 to 40 million, where in the due diligence, and in particular the scientific due diligence, becomes much more, let's call it, um, deep. That we needed to better understand this. And so we've been doing some work in particular in vitro on understanding what happens upon mitochondrial transplantation. And we, as well as the general field, has started to converge on what we believe to be a reasonable explanation of why mitochondrial transplantation work. And that explanation actually is, fortunately, a pathway that has been known to be at play in ischemia reperfusion injury generally, as well as in other areas of disease, which is mitophagy and mitogenesis. What we've shown in our internal results, and which has recently been confirmed in a Nature publication, markedly the first ever publication of mitochondria transplantation in the main nature journal. So I would say arguably um, the most rigorous scientific review you can undergo. And it's nice to see that they also see what we see and can show it from probably even more angles than we could that mitochondria upon their endocytosis and their release from the endosome trigger mitophagy and mitogenesis most likely to the presence of um, PINK1. So the researcher in the Nature Journal um, nicely showed. And so I think we now have a reasonable pathway why mitochondrial transplantation would work. Um, it also is probably not the only pathway that they activate. So just throwing a mitophagy drug at ischemia reperfusion injury may not work as well as using mitochondrial transplantation. But it gives a major mechanism, and it is one that um, also I think the field is converging on, and that I think is important for the field to mature. The second issue that we have been facing and have been in the process of resolving is productization. My co-founders always used freshly isolated mitochondria, in fact, autologous mitochondria. So mitochondria from the same patient or from the same animal. Now, we have shown that you can do mitochondria isolation, freeze the mitochondria, thaw them, and not compromise their therapeutic potential. And not only did we show that um, mitochondria per se can be allogeneic, actually, in the model of the kidney schema that I just showed you the results of, we used human mitochondria. So the efficacy of our product, our human product, the one that we intend to bring to the patient, has been confirmed already in a large animal model. So we are now really driving the train towards building mitochondria as a therapeutic modality, pioneering in preparation approaches that are amendable to both GMP manufacturing, but most importantly also scalability. 
It won't do to just do repeated centrifugation for mitochondria isolation. We have been developing off-the-shelf mitochondria, a product that can be frozen without compromise. And we've been building a pipeline of applications. In the last minutes, I want to give you a bit of a glimpse into that pipeline, because I think it's really exciting. Um, on the one hand, what we've been showing is that mitochondria can serve multiple purposes. Now, we've always used naked mitochondria as a therapeutic modality, and we believe they have a place, not just in ischemia reperfusion injury, but likely also in aging-related diseases. What we observed in these studies was, however, a very interesting dispersion pattern, let's call it that way. Namely, that mitochondria, for some reason, get accumulated mostly in the first large downstream organ that they pass. And so we thought, well, why can we not load those mitochondria to deliver medicines beyond the mitochondria that could help ameliorate not just, let's say, ischemia or perfusion injury, but also maybe amplify certain cell functions within. And so we showed we can actually load mitochondria with gene therapy constructs and see them expressed in the target organ, importantly, outside of the liver. This is an example of a kidney study. So we took mitochondria, we loaded them with mRNA for M-cherry expression, it's basically a red dye, and we showed two things. We can deliver mitochondria through the renal artery. We see them, as you can see on the left-hand side graph, we see them present after 72 hours by comparing human mitochondrial DNA to the porcine mitochondrial DNA. And then when we look at the, um, at the uh, uh, um, tissue samples, you can see very nicely the m cherry signal expressed in many of the tubular cells, which have historically been super difficult to hit, apparently. And so we're really, really excited about this opportunity as a pipeline development because it shows the platform nature. It also allows, let's say, an additional angle to mitochondria therapy, as mitochondria may, of course, be used as a Trojan horse alone, but they may be the first carrier with its own therapeutic potential. And so I think it's a really interesting um, development that we've shown. Um, also, more amendable to the field here, um, in aging-related degeneration, we've been looking at muscle waste and the mitochondria, um, uh, let's say, uh, role therein. And um, as you can see, this was a study um, done um, in, uh, in the US. My co-founder collaborated in this. Um, it showed that injection of mitochondria into the muscle of the aged mouse, in fact, improves that mouse muscle's performance. And so um, we really believe that um, mitochondria have a place in aging-related disease. I think we have to be cautious in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in, in that it's a chronic condition, meaning also a condition wherein we know much less than the acute conditions of heart attacks. But I think the work that's been done and, and that we are doing is really encouraging that this is not just for the ill, but may also be for those that will be ill. Um, within 20 seconds, I'm going to tell you what's next for Selvi. Otherwise, Frank is going to come on stage. Um, we raised 11.5 million to build a product, show its efficacy, and push the pipeline as well as the manufacturability of the product. The next big step has to be a Series A of 30 to 40 million to bring the product to the clinic. As I said earlier, it's about clinical validation. In between, we may raise a funding round of one to one and a half million, possibly from internal investors, but we are also open to discussions with new investors to accelerate our development. Because what we hadn't in the original budget was the manufacturing. And with one to one and a half million, we can already push it forward and thereby essentially save six to nine months off our pathway to the clinic. So if you're interested in either one, the smaller round or the bigger round, please come and see me. Thank you.